my friends from all over the world. Welcome once again to another uh, episode uh, or chapter of our um, hemp engineering uh, series. This one is particularly uh, uh, special because we have uh, Mrs. Anna Jacobs from Infinity Garden. She is right now in Detroit, Michigan, and she, her inspiration in the business is educate others. Uh, this is Ramon Granados, I am broadcasting from Perth, Australia. Welcome, Amna. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Uh, well, I am very happy having you with us in our show. Thank you very much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Well, tell us about yourself. How did you end up in the hemp business? Um, I started off with cannabis at a very young age, and I just I went into my schools in Kuwait, and I learned actually how to grow in Kuwait when I was 14 years old by my grandmother. She lived to 101 with Parkinson's disease. So the care for cannabis came from a very young age, and I saw the benefits of cannabis and hemp. Um, in terms of healing, in terms of healing people with diseases, or at least stopping the, prog the progression of disease. Uh, and wow. me getting into that. But yeah. now and you blow my mind that you learn how to grow in, in Kuwait. So you must have an extraordinary experience uh, uh, on regards of the prohibition. And regards in how they're grown, my grandmother wasn't educated, but she was able to have the engineers build glass that was 12 inches thick to six on the inside, six on the outside for the greenhouses to be able to withstand the heat in Kuwait. And we had to get oil. We had to get we had to purchase soil from Persia, from Iran, because there was no soil in Kuwait. It's all um, sand. Oh, my. <laughs> This was in the 80s. This was in the early 80s. <laughs> so I guess somehow with our previous discussion, your experience, uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. You must know a very deep knowledge of the biology of plants. Yes, well, we were talking about how I got into the hemp business, and I'd like to answer that for you. Recently, I had the opportunity to um, branch out and collaborate with a hemp business company. They're called Michigan Medical Hem. And the CEO, Bo Parmenter, I started working with him. And what we're doing is we're collaborating together in a joint venture to help out hemp farmers buy good seeds that have a, a high germination rate and introduce the farmers to an SOP where they can access uh, their, use the rest of their excess biomass and make it into simpler products that they can either utilize themselves or they can sell it to make extra income. As farmers, I know they don't make a lot of money. Yeah. So this would definitely help them in terms of medicinally and also for extra income for their families. Well, the income is a common factor in the, and advocates in this moment and the startups, no? <laughs> that is why it's so important for all of us to uh, make stronger uh, uh, ties and somehow collaborate uh, to make this market grow for all of us. Yes, absolutely. And then um, you asked another question. You said, what benefits to the farmer is it in understanding phytoremediation? Yeah. Now, not only is the biomass itself extremely viable nowadays, valuable because we use it in, in industrial manufacturing as well, but growing hemp outdoors, it improves soil quality as well. Specifically, hemp produced in toxic soil efficiently absorbs hazardous materials, thus ridding the dangerous contaminants. So this process is called phytoremediation and its potential is incredible for the earth. I mean, the amount of things that hemp can do compared to a regular cannabis plant is phenomenal because they even used, if you remember in history during Chernobyl, they used hemp plants all around the nuclear waste to absorb it. Yes. Like that's fascinating that a plant that existed 28.1 million years ago can still function on its own naturally if given the, the good natural environment. So um, it's a great, it's a great plant. 
It's definitely a great plant and there's a lot to learn because I think hemp is still in its infancy stages of mm-hmm. learning things about hemp. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, yeah. Talking about the plant itself, um, I do understand that you can uh, help us to understand the biology of the plant itself. Uh, the plant has the power to become from male to female or the other way around, something like this? Yeah, before before we didn't have the science or the technology to be able to make something called a reversal spray. A reversal spray is, is created by genetic breeders and they should be very well, they should be good, reputable genetic breeders. I know quite a few that are very well. And this one person, he makes something called um, reversal spray, which is a bottle of concentrated sex change solution. And what it does is it takes the male plant and it reverses it into a female. Only reason being that would be a perfect scenario for hemp is because hemp is grown outdoors and on a field. And not everybody's going to stand with every plant. Let's say you have 8,000 plants. You're not going to be able to monitor and look at every single plant if there's like a hermaphrodite site on it or if it's all male you don't want it pollinating the rest of your crop and then there you go you've lost all your money for the season so um i always make sure that people understand that you can use reversal sprays it's very it's organic it's not going to hurt the plant whatsoever if anything it's just changing and it's forcing it to go from a male into a female so you don't have that issue Mm, very important this and, and how does this uh, transform, transformation in the biology of the plant actually happen? Do, are you aware of that? Um, I think it just, I don't know the details of the reversal spray, but what my understanding was when I spoke to this breeder is mm-hmm. that it has the ability, I think of either decreasing cytokines and increasing inositol. I'm not a hundred percent sure of what the chemist, like the biochemistry is mm-hmm. of it, but it does change it. And when it changed it to a female, then you have a stable female and you don't have to worry about ever getting pollination because the pollination is where the worry is with the hemp, with the hemp farmers. They farm here in Michigan, soybeans and wheat, and that's what they're used to. So hemp for them, they'll, they'll plant it, but they don't have the knowledge base as to what to look for. If there's something that they need to look for in the plant, that's not necessarily viable for the rest of the crop. Well, knowledge is one of the things that we almost all lost uh, during the time of the prohibition. Okay. Yes, yes. And then, yeah. And then the nice thing about hemp, like its structure physically, I, I did a little diagram. I would show it to you, but my diagrams are worse than my kids. <laughs> in the center, in the center, in the center of of a hemp plant in the cross section of a hemp plant, there's like hollow space in the center, which is in every plant. If you don't have that hollow space, that means that your plant has never fed or was never feeding to begin with. There has to be that hollow space. And around it, around the hollow space, you have a woody body, which protects the hemp plant from the outside and the outdoors. And then around that, you have a fiber bundle all around it. And then just an epidermis layer, like a human person. We all have epidermis layers to a certain degree. And that's all in protection of the hemp plant. And it's a very sturdy plant. And it all usually hemp plants too, why people like to use it and make it in large amounts, not only industrial use, but for medicinal use, you can use it because it's less than 0.3% THC. And a lot of people don't want the psychoactivity. They just want a little bit of THC and more CBD. So it would be more than a one-to-one, but some people don't like the psychoactivity of THC, and I understand that. But without the two, it doesn't work. Agreed. You have to have the two for it to work. Yeah. And especially, and especially for uh, conditions that are, that need both. You know, maybe CBD by itself, it works in a way that, um, medically speaking, or from the science itself, it might be incomplete. And I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and hemp is such a, it's part of the can, the cannabis family, but it's separate from THC. Like there's, when CBD breaks down, CBD has different cannabinoids, like CBG, like lots of people when they take their um, leaves off, like their, their foliar leaves, the large leaves, they don't know that there's minuscule amounts of CBG on every single one of those large 
um, of those large foliar fan leaves. So why would you throw it out? I actually rinse it out and I cut it up and I throw it in salad. CBG, even a minuscule amount. I use the plant to the very end. I don't use the cocoa because I can't do much with the cocoa physically. <laughs> but other than that, I use the plant to the very root. Anna, um, what are you working on in this moment? Okay, so um, right now what we're, what we're working on is we're trying to teach hemp farmers, what, instead of baling, which is an expensive technique, or freezing the rest of their, their hemp, I'm trying to introduce them to something simple, such as a topical, where you can use just coconut oil and shea butter, something simple that you would have in your house or you can go to the grocery store and get. And then you want to decarboxylate your hemp at the proper temperature because CBD cooks at a different temperature than THC does. And CBD, it's actually, I shouldn't say CBD, it's CBDA. CBDA is a non-active it's a non-active form. It's just like THCA, it's non-active form. But when CBD is decarboxylated, it turns from CBD to CBDA, which is active. And when it's activated, then you just put it in oil. You let it boil at a certain temperature. It shouldn't go above 220, 240. And then you just let it go for hours. I let some of my oil go for about four to six hours, sometimes eight if it's a lot lower. Mm -hmm. And then I just let it take its time absorbing, taking out all those beautiful trichomes and everything in it and just getting absorbed into that oil because CBD and THC, they love trans fats. I mean, they adore adipose tissue. That's why when we eat edibles, we stay higher for a very longer duration. And the only reason being whether it's psychoactive or not, it's because we have a lot of endocannabinoid receptors in our gut, more so than on our skin and more so than on our brain, inside of our brain. Um, I have a question for you. So, sure. um, so with the intention of the education of your company um, and, and this product that you're able to do and this uh, obvious knowledge that you have of fetal remediation and the plan, um, you must be targeting a very large uh, audience in, in Michigan, right? Yes, because a lot of the hemp farmers, like I said, they are unaware of what to do with their excess biomass. And with so many commercial facilities right now opening up in the state of Michigan, we have a plethora of them. So the hemp farmers are selling the biomass to the commercial facilities if they need pure CBD. Now to be able to do that, it's not a big deal, but hemp has become like much cheaper in terms of per dollar because everybody's growing hemp. Right. Not everybody go, grows the best hemp, but they grow the best to their ability. Yes, yes. Especially when you, what we refer uh, on regards to the growing for flowers to extract the CBD. Yes. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Anna, uh, do you have something that you would like to share with the audience uh, with such a brilliant mind and knowledge of the plant. Um, yes, I would love to. Like when we were talking about a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of the plant, hemp, like I was saying earlier, belongs to the cannabis, the cannabaceae family, and it contains over 270 species, which is pretty large for a little library of hemp. I never ha thought hemp would have 270 species. That's pretty, that's pretty large for its database for being such a new plant reintroduced into our society again. Uh, um, and a, also um, hemp. There is a yeah, and hemp. There is a sorry. basically for everything. Yes, that's true. And then hemp consists of five main uh, components. There's the stalk, the root, the leaves, seeds, and the flower. Now the stalk is always dense. It's much denser than um, the cannabis plant and it's strong and it's got a capability of reaching over 10 feet tall, especially if you have like a plethora of land, it goes pretty good. And then the stock is composed of two layers. There's an inner layer known as the herd or shiv. And then there's an outer la layer known as the bast fiber. Um, at the top of the stock, there's, that's where all the hemp flowers grow. And then where the seeds, buds and leaves and sugar leaves are found all in that one area. Now the stock contains larger leaves 
known as fan leaves, like we discussed earlier, that carry yeah. CBG, which is really great. It's high in fiber if you get enough into your system. And then um, the herd or the shift that I talked about earlier, industrially, it's used for insulation and cellulose. They use that to make all sorts of products. With the stock, it's the best fiber and it's flexible. So that flexibility of fibers, they use it for composites, they use it for textiles, and they use it for ropes, among other things in the industry that they've created, like hempcrete. Like that's a very yeah. new, yeah. I mean, it's new. And I think it's fascinating because we're taking mother nature and we're using her and all of her essence and purposes. And we're respecting um, the earth by not destroying it, by continuing to reuse and recycle what we have. And then hemp seeds usually are very, they're small. They're about one to three millimeters in size. Um, the leaves are usually a little longer and they're slender compared to other plants. Um, they're used in pharmaceuticals. They're also used um, for pharmaceuticals and like tea purposes. Some people have hemp tea that they enjoy. It's like a calming effect. Um, the flower itself, it's different than um, THC because it produces like a, a dense spike cluster versus the male hemp flower, which is very different. It grows in a dense branch cluster. So the spike cluster is where the, the, the um, pistils and the stamens come out and all of the female flowers are there and the female structure is there. Right. Whereas with the male, all you see is little uh, dense branch clusters, which are little sacs, basically male sacs. And that's what opens up and turns into pollen. And some people can force the plant open and remove the pollen in a container if they're trying to crossbreed. Well, they I, will actually take it like a paintbrush and they will paint it on another plant. I have read a, an ad that in some countries, including here in Australia, they train bees to, to use the, you know, from the flower of the cannabis and hemp to do honey. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And it's you the can pollen use that attracts the pollen yes. and scorpions that attract the, 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 the bees, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they do do infused um, uh, honey CBD sticks that people use if they want to put it on a piece of toast in the morning. And like I said, I would encourage a one-to-one -one because I think it's um, more effective than just having the CBD itself. And like I said, if it's less than 0.3%, you're not getting the psychoactivity. If people are worried about like getting paranoid or driving or working or whatever the case may be. Um, also, the incredible thing about hemp is that it's got so much antibacterial and antifungal properties, and that's natural. It's not anything that's, that we produce. It's just naturally within the plant itself. And um, it, it has antibacterial properties to a lot of bacteria that's very common to us, like ba uh, Bacillus subtilis, um, Staph aureus, which grows on our skin naturally. We have Staphylococcus aureus all over our body. The only reason that we don't get sick is unless we get injured. And when we get injured, the skin is exposed. And that's when you get that pustulation formulation, mm -hmm. then you have to get antibiotics to treat it. Mm -hmm. So we have natural bacteria. It's just, it's amazing that this plant has antibacterial and antiviral properties in it. So it's such an infancy stages. I'm hoping people learn more about it and get excited about reading more about hemp and cannabis and understanding how the two synergistically can work for the community as well as medicinally can work for people. So the, um, the potential of addiction is gone. We have a high addiction rate in the United States. I don't know what it's like in Perth, Australia, but in, mm -hmm. in the state that I live in, there's like a large community that are addicted to a lot of pharmaceutical uh, pills, inc including like opiates or benzodiazepines. And if there's a way to get people off of that or alcohol drinking, um, that, would be, that would be a miracle for everybody. I mean, people would live longer, they would be happier, and mentally they would be sounder because I think those things all chemically change the structure of our brain over, over use, well, over time. Yeah. And now, uh, in regards of the addiction here in Perth, there is an uh, epidemic of, um, uh, of ice, which is amphetamines. Um, yes. Uh, there, people get really addicted, and a lot of young people, and it's all over. It's something that, yes. Yeah. That is very sad. 
It was sad. And then, yeah, anyway, and then moving on, we talked about, uh, you wanted to talk about a little bit about the genetics. Now, with um, hemp plants, once they're seeded into the ground, it's all incumbent on their germination rate. The germination rate is so important to farmers because, like I said, a lot of farmers, they grow soybeans with wheat here in Michigan side to side with hemp. Some understand it. A lot of them don't understand hemp. So for them, they just pop it in like they pop in any seeds and they plant it and then they just go from there. Like reversal spray is going to be a new thing introduced to them. And I'm hoping that that will encourage them to want to be more engaged in their plants and not just like, oh, it's growing. Just let it go until the season's done and then we'll pick them. But yeah, beforehand, yeah. if you can make it, if you can make the German, the seeds that you have that have a high rate of germination, be good, like grow good and grow healthy and vigorous, then your production is higher. Your CBD results are higher. And then it's easier to make products because it does have an affect on people. Yes. Like my topical is a one-to-one -one, and sometimes it's just THC. And I have hundreds of people from all over the world, including here in Michigan that love the topical because what it does is it's a healing property. THC with CBD, it heals. Like if you put it on your arm, if you have psoriasis and you use it on patches, I've done studies on people that are within my family that have psoriasis, that have MS with pain, that have arthritis, and they've used like topicals or tinctures and tinctures are oil-based. So if people don't drink alcohol or used to have an alcohol problem, don't have to worry about my stuff because everything that I do is organic and clean mm -hmm. and it doesn't have any alcohol in it because mm -hmm. I believe we don't want to encourage that taste just to get back someone into that drinking, you know, part of their lives or that addiction. We also, you and I discussed one of the questions that you wanted to talk about was, are good genetics, do they pro provide a better performance when growing for biomass? Of course, the better, the better the germination rate, the higher the yield, the larger the biomass, and the more money that you can make. And there is a potential to making money. It's just those little things that they need to change, which is the vigilance of watching your plants. And I know there's lots of plants that are grown, but if you have enough people that go out there or volunteer to go out there and help and look at the plants, help with the reversal spray and spray down the plants, um, we can have better quality products and better quality um, hemp, hemp seeds and hemp oil and any products really that people want to make with hemp. You can even make edibles, as simple as edibles with hemp, if people don't like to eat THC edibles. Anna, what is your contact number with, uh, to share it with the audience, please? Yes, my contact number is 248-910-9718. Good. And the, your webpage again? My Instagram is at Infinity Gardens, I N F I N I T E E Gardens, G A R D E N Z. This is very nice of you, Anna. Uh, I am Thank you. very grateful having you in our show. Um, I am very happy that, and um, hopefully, this message will reach a lot of people. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much. And the only message I have for, for the audience is thank you from, from Michigan to Australia. I'm grateful for having this interview. And I'm hoping that we'll have more collaborations down the road with more science as we start to learn more about the plant. And maybe next time we can talk about tissue culturing, which is a very key component for cannabis and hemp. Well, that would be extraordinary, extraordinary having you. Uh, once again in our show talking in such high smart topics right i would love to i would love to help as many people as i can well you never know what uh, this encounter will lead us huh? that's very true that's very true and i've never seen australia so i might get lucky <laughs> you never know but unfortunately we were told a couple of days ago that the uh, the flight in my resume by the 2024. So, wow, uh, that's a long time. <laughs> that's a lot of podcasts. That's a lot of podcasts, but that's okay, though. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Sure. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye. Bye.